everybody! Welcome to Phoenix Fiction Writers Podcast Episode 17, where it is our mission to create worlds out of words. I'm Hannah Heap, writer of YA Christian Speculative Fiction, author of The Terrible Tree Chronicles, Skies of Dripping Gold, and Vengeance Hunter. I'm also the multimedia manager for PFW. I'm joined today by fellow PFW authors Kale Plus Pierce and Janelle Garrett, and we are going to talk about how to utilize tropes in speculative fiction. But before we get into all that fun stuff, let's do introductions. Hello, everyone. Uh, My name is Janelle Garrett. I write fantasy. Um, Currently have a series out called the Rhodesia Chronicles. It's a flintlock fantasy series, as well as the Steward Saga, which is an epic fantasy series. Um, And I've also written a nonfiction uh, medical book called The Survival Guide for Nursing Students. I'm also the special events coordinator and the newsletter manager for PFW. As Kirsten, I'm the author of Two Lives, Three Choices, and Gynoid. I'm also the blog coordinator and website assistant for PFW. (laughs) All right, so we have some fun news for this month. Um, First off, if you didn't see it, our PFW newsletter, we released a piece of art done by Beth Wangler, and it's beautiful. Um, so that you need to really be subscribed to our newsletter because that's where you get to see all these beautiful things like a galaxy phoenix. It's amazing. So <laughs> it's, it's awesome. It is. Yeah. Um, also, this is probably my favorite piece of news, um, mostly because of the title. So coming June, PFW will have our first ground council session. So fancy name it's just a live stream but we're gonna get all like lord of the rings with it probably not (laughs) except i will because i'm me but we'll see what other people do (laughs) um so these like i'm definitely going lord of the rings if i'm on (laughs) (laughs) yeah it started out as kind of a joke name and then we just kind of went with it so (laughs) I'm happy. Um, It's going to be a 20 to 30 minute YouTube live stream every other month. So bi-monthly live stream. The first one is going to be with E.B. Dawson, C. Scott Frank, and J.E. Prozzi, and also Hannah Heath. Oh, which is me. I don't know why I just referred to myself in the third person. (laughs) You said Lord of the Rings, right? Yeah. (laughs) I'm already ready, guys. (laughs) Yeah. So the time and date is still to be announced, so keep an eye out on our social media um, because you're really going to want to stop by and chat with us and ask us questions during the live stream. It's going to be a lot of fun. On top of that, we also have some new pieces of, or just some new pieces of fiction coming out. Uh, Voyage of the Dawn, or Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Oh my gosh. Already have to edit things. Or not. I'm just going <laughs> to leave that in. It's fine. <laughs> Voyage of the Pequod by E.B. Dawson is releasing May 24th. So this is her sci-fi retelling of Moby Dick. And I'm a little over halfway finished with it right now. And it's amazing. So you all want to go pre-order it. because it's, it's just so cool. It's sci-fi, but it's written in this kind of classic novel style. And it's gorgeous. Now, a How Not to Guide for Writing Fiction. Um, I've, I've been able to see some of the things that he's been working on and it's very mind bending and also hilarious. So if you want to learn how to not write a novel, read the book. (laughs) So clever. Very, very clever. (laughs) Um, last but not least, the Pulse cover for C. Scott Frank's new sci-fi novel has been released. It's on his website and it's super cool. So head on over there and check that out. All right, so that is all for news. Now we can jump right into story time. Okay, well, I don't have much of a, as much of a crazy story as in more of a crazy plan that I'm probably not going to get finished, but I'm crazy enough to try it anyway. Um, so what I'm hoping to do the rest of this month is finally get the book, the sequel to Two Lives, Three Choices, at least the main draft finally written up and sent to betas by the end of May. I was hoping to finish up the draft today and then do some more continuity checking later because I have way too many continuity errors right now. It's not even funny. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to make that goal, hence the crazy plan part, but I think I can still make it all work by the end of May. I think you can. You've been knocking out like three to 4,000 words in every weekend, I think, for the last month at least. It's really impressive, so... 
I believe in you. Teach me your ways. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's all check back in with Kirsten at the end of this month and make sure she's still alive. <laughs> uh, might be more of a zombie at that point, but thanks for the thought. <laughs> yeah. We'll just bring you coffee and just make you keep going. Sounds good. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Uh, so my story is also less of a story and it's kind of more of a revelation. I'm finally setting into my writing process and specifically what my brain does during certain parts of my writing process. Um, this, I'm currently working on the fifth short story that I'll have published and I'm now being able to recognize and maneuver patterns that I kind of get into. So I now know first draft is always a struggle for me. The first quarter of the story is when I literally have no idea what I'm doing and I feel lost and just frustrated and really defeated. Halfway through is when I start feeling really secure about things and I think, oh yeah, totally got this. And then I hit the three quarter way part and I start thinking, everything is wrong. What am I doing? Why am I a writer? Maybe I should just move to Mexico and change my name. I don't know. It's horrible. Um, but now that I see this, it's easier for me to push through those feelings of being lost and frustrated and insecure because I know I've been here before, I've survived, mm -hmm. and it's always turned out okay. So that's been a really uh, helpful thought process. So I think um, that's been making this draft a little bit easier, at least mentally. So yay. That's a, that's a cool revelation. That's important to get to know yourself better as a writer um, and just, you know. Kind of that extra, like, you can do it, Anna. You've done it before. <laughs> you know this is what is going to happen. That's cool. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Anyways, um, I am uh, crazy busy. Uh, I I don't really have any cool stories either, except I'm just, I'm a crazy person, busy person. So I'm working on the first draft of the last um, Stuart Saga novel, so part four, um, as well as the anthology story that PFW will be putting out in the fall. Um, I'm also working on getting the audiobook of The Tale of Britain's Fury ready for publication or release, I guess, um, I'm aiming for July. And um, I'm also getting a three-part series on autism published on the Morning by Morning blog. So um, I've been a little bit busy. So, But it's, it's in a good way, um, I think. It's just more, I feel like I have a lot of half finished projects going on um so I'm kind of kind of in that like just keep swimming mindset where writing is more hard than it is fun um mm -hmm. it just takes hard work so I'm kind of in that slog right now yeah. well you've been knocking it out at the park I just read your or this weekend I read your blog post on the autism series and it's amazing so thank, thank you, you for writing that it's super cool absolutely <laughs> yeah um, all right, so that's it for our story time. Now let's talk about how to utilize tropes in fiction. So let's just real quick start out with a simple de definition. Um, well, at least I thought it was simple until I started researching it. <laughs> so let's define a trope. What are tropes? Yeah, I mean, if you want it simple, you can just look up the actual definition, which is a figurative or metaphorical use of a word or expression. Now, of course, that sounds very vague, but basically, in writing specifically, it takes a lot of different forms, depending on the genre, genre that you're writing in. Um, so breaking it down, uh, for a writer, it can look like using a well-known or beloved element a reader comes to expect when reading a certain genre and then trying to make it your own. Awesome. Yeah, that's. I've always thought of tropes as basically the good version of a cliché. Um, they're recurring character types, themes, plot devices um, that are specific to a genre. So, for example, the chosen one is a really common trope in fantasy. Yeah. Um, but then they don't always have to be character types. Like the chosen one's a character type, but they could be actions like the kicking the dog trope is where the bad guy just does something ridiculously bad and kind of unnecessary just to prove like how villainous they are. Mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes their motivations, like the, hello, my name is Amigo Montoya <laughs> trope of, uh, you know, a character's family's dead, and so now they're going to go in an exact revenge, so that's more of a motivation trope. So mm -hmm. they come in all sorts of different forms. Yep. Yeah, that was basically my definition as well. The tropes usually cliche, specific to the genre of the book, but 
I think in addition to being, you know, character types, plot points, or even motivations, there are some tr other tropes as well in just other elements of the book. For example, setting, for example, sci-fi either tends to take place in the future or an alien planet. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's necessarily considered a trope, but I think it kind of does. Yeah. And then yeah. Also just certain aesthetics, you know, among other elements too. Yeah. It can be subtle tropes, not necessarily right in your face. Yeah, that's a good point. They can be very subtle. Yeah, and honestly, until you just mentioned that about settings, I'd never thought about those as being tropes, but they totally are. Mm -hmm. And now I want to write a sci-fi that is not set in the future, because that is an interesting <laughs> trope. <so. laughs> yeah, that would be a very interesting take on, on a, that trope. Yeah. 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 Somebody do that. <laughs> <laughs> would that be more in sci-fi or surrealism then? Yeah, that's true. Oh. Surrealistic sci-fi? That's good. Uh, I like it. I like it. <laughs> so cool. All right. So what are the benefits of using tropes in speculative fiction? I think some of the benefits of using tropes, they can be useful for jumping off points for both writers and readers. So if a writer is struggling with how to continue a story, tropes can be a good starting point. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I always think of tropes kind of like you use them like Legos. So you start out with a really basic trope and then you kind of build out from there and just keep stacking. So you have like a foundational trope, but then you can make it into something really cool and unique and everybody's looks different. Yeah, And also for readers, using a trope well can either make them feel right at home in the book. On the other hand, it can, you can an author can also use the trope to all the reader into a false sense of security because they think they know what's going to happen. Yeah. And then the author can subvert the trope and then you have no idea what's going to happen next. <laughs> or you could use the trope as a red herring to distract the reader from what's actually going on. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's super cool. Yeah. Um, another aspect of tropes that relates to the reader, like Kirsten was talking about, is something that Grace Crandall touched on in our podcast on writing short stories. Um, and she mentioned, and I thought this was really cool, so I'm just going to repeat her and give her credit. Um, tropes are a really easy way to create an image without using up too much page space. So they're really helpful for short stories in particular. Readers of a specific genre are generally really familiar with certain tropes. So if you kind of beat, briefly touch on a trope, for instance, like futuristic sci-fi or the chosen one or, um, you know, medieval fantasy, it readers' imaginations will just instantly fill in the gaps because they know the tropes. And so you don't have to spend time trying to describe all of this and waste page space that you could be using for something else. That's good. That's a good point about using it for short stories. That it can be really helpful in that case. Um, another helpful benefit, I think, would be uh, world building. I think um, Kirsten you know, has touched on it a little bit, but readers expect like a rich expansive, um, unique world when they pick up speculative fiction. And they expect it to be at least moderately different than the reality that we all live in. Um, so for example, fantasy readers tend to enjoy the going on a quest trope because it allows for rich world building um, while the characters are on that journey for whatever you know their mission is. So of course, a writer needs to avoid making it cliche and need to add their own spin to it. Um, but the trope itself can be beneficial. Um, and of course, there are other beneficial tropes, but, you know, time won't l allow us to get into all of them. But it, it does allow, especially in speculative fiction, it allows for world building. That's awesome. Yeah. So just to recap, because we touched on a lot of really cool things, we can use it for world building, character development. If you're really stuck on a plot and don't know where to go, you start out with a trope. It can help um, conserve page space for short stories. So tropes can be kind of taboo. Um, but there are so many different uses for them. So don't shy away from them. Just kind of do yep. your research and see mm -hmm. what cool spin you can put on it. Yep. 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 Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. So now that we've talked about all of the awesome things that tropes can do, what are the downsides and pitfalls to using tropes? Well, if you don't create your own spin on the tropes you use, or if you use too many tropes, in a really short amount of space. It can make your story kind of predictable, boring, and kind of unimaginative overall because 
the readers are like, we've seen this already. We know this is where it's going to go. Not exactly exciting. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. It's important to understand that you also won't please every reader, though. Um, some readers expect certain tropes when they pick up a story in a certain genre. So not having those tropes then, you know, would make them put the book down. So you have like this catch 22 where you just can't please everybody. Um, so for example, like the whole love triangle trope in YA that we all hate, um, <laughs> a lot of readers want that. Um, and they, they won't read a book unless it has that. So the, the challenge then is to make it interesting, to make it interesting uh, take on a certain trope. However, it's been, you know, this particular one has been so overused, you run the risk of boring readers. Um, so it's just a challenge. You, as, as writers, I think, anyway, my tendency is to try to throw out the trope. Um, but then, I, of course, you risk, you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So we have to understand our audience, basically, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. No, I love that because it just occurred to me that if you you can use if you don't use a specific trope, you can end up really betraying your readers. So like romance is a classic ex example of yep. people really expect a happily ever after. But then mm -hmm. if you don't give people that, they're going to be really bummed. So you have to make sure that you're kind of playing by the rules while also still being interesting. Yep. Yeah. Um, but also, on top of that, readers who aren't familiar with your genre may feel really lost or confused by specific yeah. tropes. Um, I think one of the reasons I hate love triangles so much is because I do not read romance, and so I don't want that. So if I walk into a book and it has this trope that I'm not a fan of or I've never really encountered before, um, then I'm going to feel confused. So you can't rely too heavily on tropes. You have to make sure that you're kind of hedging your bet a little bit so that way new readers won't get into the middle of the story and just think, oh, this story is not meant for me. I'm, it, this is too advanced or not um, mm -hmm. geared towards me. I just repeated myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a really popular uh, series of books out right now with a love triangle. And it's very, it's a stereotypical, mm -hmm. like, just straight up love triangle with nothing interesting about it. And yet it is hugely popular series. Um, and so that's just one example of a, re of a, of a writer who knows her YA audience specifically. She's going for a very niche um, uh, corner of the market for, for fantasy YA readers um, with using and utilizing that trope. So it's you just, yeah, you run that risk of alienating people. While at the same time, annoying a lot of other people. So it's just, it's a hard balance. Yeah. Like, I hate that you just said, there's a very popular series with <laughs> the love triangle. And I'm thinking, and I can think of like eight different series right now. That yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, it's I hate that so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Um, and then back to, Kristen had mentioned, yeah, if you end up, using the same trope and then not putting a twist on it um, which is just something that lazy writers tend to do you do end up with a really predictable boring story nobody wants that so don't don't use that just as a way to not do work that's not what tropes are for <laughs> um, and then lastly and one that I think is really important to remember is some tropes are really damaging and they fall into the stereotyping or misrepresentation category um, so you really want to make sure that that's not what you're doing um, I'm trying to think yeah like a common one is, you know, like the fat sidekick friend who's just there for comedic relief kind of thing. And just to support like the beautiful skinny main character, like that's not, don't, don't do that. <laughs> so you have to just really um, look at the tropes that you're using very carefully and think about how is this affecting my readership? And is this a positive representation or is this harmful? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah definitely. All right, so with all of that said, what are some tips for utilizing tropes to our advantage without making of all of the errors that we just mentioned? I think a good place to start is you know, figure out the basic trope you want to use and then see if you can add your own twist to it. If you're having trouble figuring out the exact twist, then another approach you can take is, okay, this trope seems to be something that'd be good for me to use, but it's kind of annoying, figure out what is annoying about the trope and then fix it in your work. If you, that's the perfect opportunity to write any wrongs done by that trope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then also 
Kristen, you had mentioned earlier that you can even use tropes. Tropes can be related to aesthetic, which also I had never thought about before, which made me think you can also use tropes for research. So you can start out with a trope that you know of, then use that to research and dig deeper. And that's a kind of a really good way to add depth. Um, So like, for instance, if you want to write a story with like a Hispanic aesthetic, and maybe you only know about sugar schools. And so that's like the only thing that you can think of related to like Hispanic aesthetic. So then you start researching sugar schools, uh, see like the history of them, where they came from. And then you're going to start stumbling across all sorts of new aesthetics that you can build into your world. And that's kind of a fun way to use a general trope and then take it and make it really cool and interesting. Um, But it does require work, which goes back to the whole, you can't just lean on tropes. You have to actually dig into them. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. And it's, you know, know your audience. I mean, essentially, you have to know beyond a shadow of a doubt what is going to annoy them and Mm -hmm. what is not going to annoy them. So it's just incredibly important to know who you are writing for. Um, And then this, of course, will help you know what to focus on and what to let fall to the wayside. So, for example, you know, the YA love triangle, Um, instead of looking at it from one angle, which is typically character development, that's why authors use that trope, um, look at it from a different angle angle and ask a different question. So instead of saying, can I use this to build my characters, you say, can I use this to build world building? Um, Or what about using it as a plot point primarily, as opposed to a character development arc? So, well, then this opens up a whole new world of approaching your story. So maybe in your world, you know, it's expected that people won't be monogamous. And so the love triangle element actually brings out a theme like fidelity, where the main character makes the choice to only love one person for their whole life. And so this just takes, you know, that one love triangle thing we hate and spins it (laughs) and says, I'm actually going to make this love triangle a theme of fidelity as opposed to, oh, I love more than one person. Um, And then, of course, this, you know, you can use it then secondarily as, you know, a character arc. Um, But actually, primarily in that story, hypothetically, you're using it as a world building element and as a theme uh, generator. That's super cool. Yeah. And then also part of knowing your audience, you, in order to know what tropes your readers expect or want, it's really important to read within the genre that you're writing. And not just a little bit, like a lot. You have to read so many and you'll start then identifying tropes and you'll be able to see, you know, oh, I like this or oh, this is, why does this exist? I'm going to fix this one. Um, So that you can get all sorts of ideas for that. Yeah, that's really good. Mm -hmm. Um, Or on the opposite side is reading stories outside of your genre to find tropes that are interesting, but that don't technically exist within your genre, but you think you could pull in in an interesting way. So you're still using tropes, but it'll be more surprising for your reader because your reader might not be as used to that particular trope. I like that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So many options, guys. So I think a lot of it just comes down to you just have to sit down and think about it for a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) And read and know your audience. (laughs) Yes. So much time. (laughs) Invest your time. problem. It's so easy. Why do we have such a hard time with this? (laughs) (laughs) Because we all just have limitless time on our hands. We should be able to do this. No. All right, so what are some of our favorite tropes that we'd personally like to see more of? Okay, this is more of a trope I've seen in sci-fi shows rather than books, but I kind of always liked the concept of a time loop that always seems to appear like at least one episode of at least the two shows I can think of off the top of my head are Stargate SG-1 and one episode in in Legends of Tomorrow, where basically a character is repeating the same day over and over and over, trying to figure out what's going on and why they're the only ones who remember they're in the time loop. I always thought that was an interesting kind of trope, and I wouldn't mind seeing it more in books, unless I just haven't come across the books that have that trope in there. It'd just be kind of an interesting way to, you know, A, develop character, but like Janelle was mentioning, it could also be a good opportunity to develop the world a little bit more as well. Oh, that's cool. And yeah, I don't think I've read 
any books with time loops. Have you? Uh, yeah, I was trying to think that I don't think so. That's a fascinating <gasps> idea. You should do it. Yes. Do it. Do it. Do it. <laughs> Yeah, after I get the sequel done, then I'll consider it. <laughs> nice. I'm going to hold you to that because I really want to read this now. <laughs> I'm thinking in an anthology story. I don't know. Oh. Just saying. Just saying. <laughs> yeah, hint, hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Um, One of my favorites, I couldn't figure out if it had a name or not. So I went on to TV Tropes and they call it Awesomeness by Analysis. Don't know if that's the real term or if it's just made up by them, but I like it, so I'm going with it. Um, but basically, it's when a character it's used in action scenes, and a character has to make a decision really quickly, usually in combat. And so then they take a couple of like seconds, and then they start kind of looking at their surroundings and tallying it up, like, oh, there are this many exits, there are this many guys I have to fight, I can run this fast without running out of breath, like all of these different calculations. Um, it's used a lot in Jason Bourne and in the Sherlock Holmes movie with Robert Downey Jr. And I just think it's really fun and it's kind of a cool new way to do action scenes rather than just your general action sequence. It's kind of um, gets you inside of your character's head and slows things down a little bit while also having like a weirdly fast paced feel to it. It's really cool. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um... It's something cool to see visually mm -hmm. on TV. Oh, yeah, um, definitely. Um, it would be interesting to see how that could be played out in a book. I like that. Yes. Um, I, I may or may not have put a scene, one of those scenes in the story that I'm writing currently. So it totally yeah. works for a book because I wasn't sure if it would, but it does. So guys, <laughs> start doing this, please. <laughs> it's so fun. <laughs> like it. Can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I am partial uh, to, like, the stories of revenge. So, um, Count of Monte Cristo, where, you know, somebody is wronged, and they seek the, out the revenge. You know, Les Mis comes to mind. Right? But where Victor Hugo, he uses that trope in a very redemptive way. Um, and I think this trope in particular has the ability to really speak into a common human experience that we all have of how to deal with loss and suffering um, when people inflict it intentionally. Um, whether it's on a grand scale or even just a small scale, but we all experience that as humans who hurt each other. Um, and I, I kind of explored it in my uh, Justice series of short stories. Um, and I'd love to see it explored more. I don't know. It's one of those things where I feel like it, it's a, it, a lot of writers use it, um, and I love it. And I love to see it used in different creative ways. So. Yeah, that's one of my favorites as well, because that's also like the Inigo Montoya mm -hmm. kind of thing. And yeah, you're right, because it has some cool, it works well for character motivation, but you can bring out some really cool themes and stories as well, which I mm -hmm. keep, keep meaning to mention. Tropes usually can be used for multiple things at once. Yeah. So maybe they're meant for world building, but they can also connect to character development, or maybe they're for motivation, but also connect to themes, so uh, don't just use them for one thing. Yep. yep. Yeah. All right, so th this question's fun. What about our least favorite trope that we want to see die? I think we already know that love yes. triangles is one. <laughs> I purposely didn't say that because I don't want to, like, bash it too much. I actually kind of enjoyed it in The Hunger Games. Um, so like there's, there's sometimes I enjoy it, just not all the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> my least favorite is like kind of a young male coming of age, go find the sword. And then he's more capable than he thought he was. Like, um, that tends to be a very predictable type of plot line. Um, however, I enjoy this when it's turned on its head. Mm -hmm. So not to spoil anything for people who haven't read the Stuart saga, but I kind of tackled this topic in that series of like, how can I turn this trope around? Um, and so it's like, oh, I have a destiny. And it's like, mm, OK, whatever. We all know everybody has a destiny. So tell me something more interesting. Um, <laughs> another one that I really hate is the evil step parents. Like, why? Who decided that all step parents have to be evil? <laughs> like, who decided that? Like, come on. So parents can be really awesome. Like, why do we do this? Anyways. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's one of those that that's just a really damaging trope. That was one of my yes. favorite things yeah. about the Ant-Man movies is that the stepdad is actually really cool and they all have kind of a healthy relationship. All of the adult yes. parents do. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Why has this never existed before? 
Mm-hmm. Yep. Right. It's such a stereotype, and it really does more harm than good, for sure. Yep. Let's see. For me, yeah, love triangles. That's okay. <laughs> But I agree with Janelle. It, you know, sometimes if it's, you know, subverted over its head or, yeah, you know, if it's done well, it really works. Like, for example, one love triangle I actually thought worked really well was um, by Jennifer Akers. It was, called, the title was On the Way to Simple. So there was a love triangle going on, but the love interests were sort of staggered out. So there was clearly a love triangle going on, but it wasn't like being torn between two people. Yes. I kind of liked that twist. And then let's see. The other trope, again, similar to John L. Now, um, I kind of wish there would be less strain between like the YA protagonist and their parents. That seems to be another trope that's mm. common. Like, or either, like either the relationship between the parent and child is strained or the parents are dead. It's like mm. there are healthy relationships with parents. <laughs> Guys, they exist. We can have that represented in books a little bit more. I, yeah. After Bambi, you guys, I just, <laughs> I just can't. I can't anymore. Like, stop <laughs> killing all the moms. Seriously. They don't have to die. Oh. For yeah. me, it was Little Fit, Littlefoot's mom. Oh, from my the God. Oh. <laughs> Not even yes. bring that up. Oh, why? Why? Too soon, Hannah. Too soon. <laughs> It ruined oh, my childhood. I know. It was awful every single time. Every all four hundred times I watched it. Oh, gosh, I don't think I ever cried during that scene. But what? Do you not have a soul? Like what? I don't cry at movies. Okay. Oh, well, gosh. I'm trying to remember last time I cried in a movie. I can't remember. <laughs> Cry in Avengers? What? No. Nope. Oh man. Fair warning, I haven't seen Endgame yet, so uh, like... okay, all right, all right. So if you don't cry in that, I mean, this might be a... there's a first time for everything. I'm just saying. <laughs> hey, I'm a bit skeptical. What? I didn't cry in Infinity War or any of the other Avengers movies. Yeah, <laughs> oh, <my gosh>. oh. <laughs> So this, this now movie... you're gonna try to find a movie to make me cry, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is okay. I'm oh, yes. I'm going to write a story. That makes you cry. Somehow. Yeah, to that. Somehow. <laughs> oh man. Um. But yeah, Kirsten, the um, the parents being dead or the characters, young adult characters not getting along, I think is a really good example of when writers just get like lazy because it is admittedly a lot easier to write a story for young adults when the parents are removed from the situation because you don't have the parent telling the kid like that's so dumb why would you do that (laughs) (laughs) so but there are point yeah like there are something to think it (laughs) like i mean so many books would end if they had their parents just saying stop you dummy no and then the book's over yeah 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 Yeah, you know a little moral support or from the parents, not a bad thing. Just saying. <laughs> Granted, I am slightly guilty of this because my protagonist's parents aren't around. But hey, they're <laughs> not. They're not dead. They're MIA. There's a difference. <laughs> and she had a good. And she had a good relationship with them. So there you go. There you go. Well, right there. Nice. Um, yeah. So my, you all mentioned a lot of my pet peeve ones. Um, another one that I'm just really not a fan of is the uh, fantasy being set in medieval European times. Um, like, that's cool for sure, but it's so overdone. So I think you can do world building in a lot of other really cool ways using different cultures and different time periods. And it's baffling to me that a lot of authors don't do that. So just like, guys, it just expand a little bit. It'll be awesome. <laughs> Please. <laughs> so that's uh love triangles obviously um and then disabled characters who just die (laughs) to act as motivation for the the non-disabled main character that really bothers me yep yeah yeah that or they're like kind of the what's that character's name 
the back oh Batgirl who's in the wheelchair. So there's always like the disabled characters kind of they're the overwatcher kind of person. So they sit on the sidelines and just kind of support other characters as they do awesome things and then they never get to really have their own personality or agency or do really anything. Um that's really unfortunate and I need I, to go away. It's one of the reasons why I loved X-Men so much, because they did Professor uh Xavier so well as a disabled character. Yeah. Um where they didn't fall into that pitfall. So yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So and then yeah, there are just uh, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm like, oh no, this is upsetting now because I'm thinking of other disability <laughs> tropes. Like the the whole yeah. autistic character is also a savant and they have like Mm-hmm. magical mind powers i'm like that's not it yeah. no <laughs> um, yep, yep. Oh. so do your research and uh make sure that your tropes are actually accurate and not hurting people and you should be okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah so what books or movies or tv shows do you think have utilized tropes well yeah i think um, one of my favorites um, has been uh, from J.E. Perazzi's Malfunction series, um, Cal Coven. So he's your stereotypical white boy with a chip on your shoulder, um, who's kind of a, a punk, but he's done really well. So he um, he's hilarious. He's just freaking hilarious. And then his backstory is just like so incredible. So um, I think Perazzi does it really well. Um, I also enjoy um, M.L. Wang's um, Sword of Kagan. So she took my least favorite trope, the coming of age, you know, going on a mission type of thing and um, turn it on its head. Now, I can't explain why, because that would be a major spoiler. But she did it really well in her Sword of Kagan book. And then the Marvel Universe. I feel like they do a pretty good uh, job with the whole time travel trope. They did a really good job with the alternate realities trope. Um, So I think there's some things about the Marvel universe that kind of I don't like but I thought I thought they did those pretty well yeah I I do love that about Marvel and actually next month we're doing a blog post about the Marvel Cinematic Universe and writing lessons learned from it so I'm excited Mm -hmm. to talk about that aspect of them um yeah so for me I think Harry Potter has some really great tropes because Rowling does a really good job of kind of subverting expectations. Um, yeah. Like she has the old mentor trope in Gumb- in Dumbledore. Um, but then the twist is Dumbledore kind of sucks. And he makes really, he's not a good mentor. He should not be allowed around children. I don't know what the deal is with that. <laughs> You're yeah. some yeah. guidelines. Have fun. Good luck. I'm proud of you. Yes. <laughs> um. So that's interesting. And then she also does the chosen one trope really well, I thought, because there's that cool twist with Neville Longbottom and maybe Harry Potter wasn't the chosen one after all. And that was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, Also, on the other hand, Star Wars does a really great job with just straight up tropes that aren't really, there aren't any like surprises and it's still really interesting. So like Han Solo's your typical scoundrel character with a heart of gold um the empire is the classic big big bad guy with all of their little minions and they're just super powerful (laughs) um and so yeah i think star wars because they have kind of the soap opera thing going on those tropes work really well when they're just unaltered so i like that yeah and let's see for me um kind of going along the mentor theme i think hey mitch from the hunger games was a pretty good example of the cynical or surly mentor he's definitely cynical when it comes to dealing with his trauma and his own experience from the games and he doesn't handle that in the best way definitely but you know it's shown throughout the books that he is st- extremely strategic and cares for both Peta and Katniss quite frankly they would not have survived any of the games without him so yeah. <laughs> he, was, he was a good mentor in his own way <laughs> yeah I like that yeah Hunger Games actually now that I'm thinking about it did a lot of really cool tropes I don't personally like that series, but I thought it's actually good, (laughs) if that (laughs) makes any sense, and the tropes is one of the things that makes it good. You can appreciate good, a good story, and a good trope if you don't prefer that genre. Yeah, You can at least see the decisions 
says and cons made and why she made them. And definitely, if you don't, even if you don't like the story, you can definitely understand and respect the decisions she made. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I think that concludes all of our thoughts about trope. So let's talk about book club. Um, Kristen, what are you reading right now? Well, Beth Wangler and I took forever to decide on a book. Um, Beginning of May was crazy for both of us. I think we finally decided on Son of the Mountain by Michelle Isenhoff. Hopefully I didn't butcher that last name. Sorry if I did. So that's what we're reading for the hashtag author book club on Twitter. Is that um, a, I, wait, is that a, sorry, is that a classic novel or an indie? Indie. Oh, okay. For horrifying a minute, I thought it was a classic novel that I didn't know about. And I thought, oh no, I failed as a writer. <laughs> I don't know about a bunch of classic novels, so don't worry. Okay. Bethany Wangler's is the classic novel person. Yes. Um, so I am reading the Lightbringer series by Brent Weeks. Um, it's been really good. I'm on book two. I'm also reading Mark of the Raven by Morgan. Um, I think it's Pousset. I don't know how to pronounce her last name either. Um, I'm also reading Hero Forged by Josh Erickson. Cool. How are you liking Mark of the Raven? Because I keep seeing that all over the place and it looks awesome. Uh, it's it's very interesting. I've only gotten about 15% through, according to my Kindle. Um, so I'm still kind of getting into it. I don't have a whole lot of opinions about it yet. So Cool. Awesome. All right. So right now I am almost done reading Voyage of the Pequod by E.B. Dawson. I'm actually going to finish it tonight once my Kindle battery charges. Um, <laughs> and that book's amazing. Also, I'm reading your book, Janelle, uh, Rift in the Deep. Stop it. It's so good. <laughs> it is. I read it. It's great. Yes. <laughs> I you. love it. I think I'm about halfway through right now and it's amazing. I love all of the characters. And usually you switch point of views quite often, and usually I end up having, like, one point of view I don't enjoy, but in your book, I love all of them. So I'm always excited when we switch point of view, because I'm like, oh, I love this character, too. <laughs> so... <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, and then I'm also listening on audiobook to The Electrical Menagerie by Molly E. Reader, and I'm only, like... 10 minutes into it but I already really like it so I need to read all those books <laughs> so many books not enough time and then I need to write mm. yeah the, the Molly reader ones on my TBR I need to get to that one yeah it's super cool um all right so that is it for the podcast um if you like this podcast make sure to visit our website at phoenixfictionwriters.com and check out all of the cool stuff we have on there you can also follow us on Twitter at Phoenix underscore fiction. Visit us on Facebook. Um, go ahead and subscribe to us if you haven't already on iTunes or YouTube or both. Um, give us a thumbs up. Leave us a review on iTunes. We really appreciate that. Send us tweets. Uh, we would love to hear about your favorite and least favorite tropes, either just on social media or in the comments section below. Uh, you get bonus points if you, too, hate love triangles. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm interested to see who actually likes them. Um, who who, who yeah, like not them. like a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> so anybody who's actually an adult who likes love triangles. So that's what I'm interested in here. Yeah. So definitely let us know if you're one of those rare people because that's I don't think I've met anybody. So yeah. <laughs> make yourself known to the world. <laughs> yeah we won't judge we're kidding yeah, no, judge, oh so judgment free obviously oh yeah clearly totally not gonna make fun of you behind your back no way <laughs> oh, all right so where can we find you online uh Kristen? um on twitter and most other social media platforms you can find me with the handle at kl pierce books and my website is also www.klpiercebooks.com. Awesome. What about you, Janelle? I am on social media as well. I'm on uh, Twitter at Janelle G. Ryder. I'm also uh, blogging at JanelleGarrettWriter.com. Cool. 
Cool. And you can find me on Twitter at underscore Hannah Heath and on my website at hannahheathwriter.com. All of our websites and Twitters and all that fun stuff is linked below, so be sure to go check that out. Um, also, as a reminder, the June podcast is on writing lessons learned from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And that's going to be with myself, Beth Wangler, and E.B. Dawson. And we all have very differing opinions about the most recent Avengers movie and probably about all of the other movies as well. So it's going to be really fun. Make sure to subscribe and stay tuned for that. Um, thank you so much, Janelle and Kirsten, for talking. It was awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. Bye.